First of all, we want to thank uh, the South African Embassy for uh, accommodating all of us. We didn't expect so many people. We thought we'd just be a handful, but you can see the outpour uh, of love and support for what we consider to be a shining light in these dark times led by the people and government of South Africa. So we, we come not as Muslims, we come not as uh, Arabs, uh, we come as fellow members of the human family. Uh, and we honor the South African government for leading all of us, including Muslim majority countries in this path for justice. So we hope that some leaders of our Islamic world can take lessons from the government of South Africa in working for peace and justice. And as I was walking in, I saw the statue of Nelson Mandela, the towering figure, and you look up and you feel like he's even taller in stature than, than that statue. And the, the term that caught my attention that was on that statue is that he, it's listed that he was a political prisoner. He was a fighter for freedom. He was a fighter for justice. He was a man of compassion, as that quote, as we see, uh, articulates. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And those words are true to this day as they were decades ago. But the other term that, I, that caught my attention is that it's listed that he was a political prisoner. In many ways, in many ways, we are all political prisoners of the policies leading the world today. We're all held hostage to witnessing genocide, destruction, decimation of a whole population. And so we are here to commemorate the work that is undone, leading and led by Nelson Mandela, that work for justice. I remember in 1986, at the Islamic Center of Southern California, we held our first anti-apartheid conference. And at that time, somebody was on the panel named Karen Bass. Karen Bass is now the mayor for the city of Los Angeles. I think she needs to do another conference on anti-apartheid that, unfortunately, hit, hits home as well as it's hitting Palestine today. So I want to highlight three points as we say thank you to Ambassador Endumiso Nchinga and his staff here and the government of South Africa. Number one, what South Africa is doing is leading the world in holding ourselves accountable to international humanitarian law. Without real action, towards international law, they remain empty words. We can articulate them all we want, but if we don't follow them with action, then they mean nothing and suffering will continue. The United Nations was formed for the, for the primary purpose of preventing genocide. That is its purpose and that is what we're committed to in investing in the United Nations and the International Court of Justice. And so, as I said, we owe a debt of gratitude to the government of South Africa and to the African continent. And there's a story of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The first exodus, the first hijra, was not to Medina. The first hijra was to Africa. He sent people to an African kingdom led by a Christian king. And they went there because he told them he is a just ruler. And so back then, as well as now, we owe a debt of gratitude to the African continent and to the African people. Secondly, on the issue of Palestine, Palestine has been and will always be the land of all the prophets. In our religion, we are told we make no distinction from the prophets. 
Therefore, anyone who follows any of those prophets, they are protected by Islam. And we also encourage all forms of worship. So Palestine represents religious coexistence. And we need religious pluralism now to overcome religious nationalism. Palestine has always existed and it will, inshallah, God willing, it will be free again with our work. The genocide taking place now only underscores how vital the struggle is. Their hope is to annihilate. Our mission is the same as it was in South Africa. End apartheid and liberate the world from the last remnants of colonialism in religious ethno-nationalism. The Bible was used to exploit, the, the Bible was exploited to justify slavery in America for centuries. And now it's being exploited for this genocide. Only we, the people, can end this misery. And we have to re recall that in our scripture, in our work, Bombs may destroy buildings. Bombs will destroy families. But they cannot bomb and destroy the idea of a free Palestine. Truth, as the work of Nelson Mandela illustrates to all of us, truth and justice will prevail with the leadership of our South African ambassador and the government of South Africa and the rest of us. The last thing I want to say is that this struggle is not between religions. This struggle is not even between ethnic groups. It's not targeted against the Jewish faith or the Jewish people. The struggle is between a vision of supremacy and remnants of colonialism on one side and on the other, a vision of mutual security and the rule of law on the other. What South Africa has done is bring back the idea of the rule of law that should govern all of us, not the rule of one group over another. And the greatness of Nelson Mandela was based on working out of love for people and not out of hate of the other. For a positive piece of justice is more important than a negative piece of occupation and subordination. Religion was established for the purpose of justice for the other. As the Quran says, O you who have attained to faith, establish justice and be witnesses to God even if you have to testify against yourself, your parents, or your own community. That is the standard of justice for us. And that is what South Africa has been representing to the rest of the world. The Quran also says, O humanity, you have been created from a single pair, a male and a female, and made into different nations and tribes so that you may come to know one another. So, brothers and sisters, what we are here today for is to say thank you to the government of South Africa under the leadership of Ambassador Ndumiso Nchinga, and also to celebrate and to envision a world where the human family and human dignity are respected one, once again. Thank you very much. And now I would like to uh, call on one of our colleagues. Uh, she represents the Jewish Voice for Peace and she made it a point, Jewish Voice for Peace, not Voices. And another thing in religion is that we usually have, you know, the, the leader that represents all of us, and we're supposed to have one voice. The reality is there are many voices. And this is a Jewish voice for peace. Please welcome Shelley Cohen Fudge. I'm honored to join you here today. Jewish Voice for Peace deeply appreciates South Africa's filing of its case at the International Court of Justice accusing Israel of the crime of genocide. 
and in persisting in its demand to prevent further unspeakable suffering and death in violation of international law. Never again should mean never again for anyone. Those of us who are Americans, well, first of all, those of us in this room, all of us are likely asking, how can Americans stay silent in the midst of a genocide? Those of us who are American are likely asking, how can we carry it on in our name with our tax dollars? Well, it doesn't take rocket science to determine the reason for that. We are all fully aware of how APAC and U.S. Israeli organizations funnel millions of dollars into swaying elected officials at the federal, state, and local levels of the U.S. government to oppose a ceasefire in Gaza. Like many Jewish Americans, I grew up in a world of contradictions. Growing up, I was taught the value of freedom of speech and separation of church and state. In large part, that was due to the fact that I grew up in a tight-knit Jewish community in a small town in the southern United States that was overwhelmingly Southern Baptist and racially segregated. My father was the only one in his family who were from the Deep South who supported civil rights. But he taught my brothers and me that the Arabs were terrorists who wanted to throw all the Jews in Israel into the sea. I was also taught that if we weren't vigilant, the Holocaust would happen again at any time, right here in America. Jewish American kids like me were repeatedly told by our parents and our family members, you are the victim. You are vulnerable. Never forget that. This really hasn't changed since I was a child. For many Jewish Americans, the repetition we hear of never forget allows our religious identities to be transformed into a political slogan that often is displayed on a large sign planted in the front lawn outside many Jewish American synagogues. And that reads, we stand with Israel. I now work with many young Jewish Americans who have joined Jewish Voice for Peace, who tell me how estranged they are now feeling from their families, particularly after October the 7th. They tell me about the difficulty they are having bringing up Gaza or about anything related to Palestinian rights with their parents, siblings, and others. Jewish Voice for Peace is the largest progressive Jewish anti-Zionist organization in the world. I founded the DC Metro chapter of Jewish Voice for Peace in 2010. We believe that Jewish tradition calls upon us to stand up for justice. We work toward dismantling the US institutions and structures that sustain injustice. We are dedicated to building a diverse, multiracial, cross-class, intergenerational, life-sustaining movement to dismantle Israeli settler colonialism, occupation, and apartheid. Since October the 7th, Jewish Voice for Peace has doubled in size. 
We're experiencing a growing interest on the part of Americans to learn more about Zionism, as well as what it means to be both Jewish and anti-Zionist. JVP has held scores of protests over the past four and a half months. I believe many of you may have heard about some of these. Among the protests, we've halted Congress, we shut down Grand Central Station in New York City during rush hour, we took over the Statue of Liberty, shut down the Manhattan Bridge, disrupted the President's Hanukkah party at the White House, blockaded President Biden's motorcade. We will continue to organize protest actions across the country, calling for a permanent ceasefire as long as it takes. We are united in the belief that when we say never again, it must include Palestinians. From our ancestors who endured pogroms and genocide, we have learned to persist. And we are determined to persist until Palestine is free. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you to the Muslim <laughs> Public Affairs Council. And I am very proud to be here with you. Thank you, Shelley, for <clears throat> leading us in, in such courageous and wonderful work. Um, and now we're going to have uh, Mr. Yazan uh, Abushi uh, explain some of the artwork that we would like to donate to this embassy. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the Embassy of South Africa and um, for hosting us today. Um, my name is Yezan. I am Palestinian, uh, born and raised here in Maryland. And growing up, Palestine was nothing but a distant memory to me, uh, as the son of Palestinian refugees who had never seen their own homelands. Um, you know, I, I'd hear the most fantastic daydreams and illustrations about what our homes used to look like, what our landscapes used to look like, and it wasn't until I first went to Palestine in 2017 that I understood just what we had lost. <clears throat> I come from a long line of farmers and agrarians, and when we visited the lands uh, that contained the ruins of our village, what remained were these olive trees. Now these just aren't any olive trees. In Palestine, uh, old growth olive trees are referred to as rumiyas, in reference to the fact that they were planted during the Roman times. These olive trees, the oldest of which in Palestine, have reached over 5,000 years old. The one in this photo is over 1,000 years old. That spoke to me. That spoke to me growing up as a Palestinian American who was always told that you have no history on this land, you have no claim to this land, Seeing these trees was like seeing my own relatives. This is my cousin who accompanied us on, on this trip, and seeing him enveloped in this tree, it's almost like seeing him standing behind an old ancestor. I think that being able to receive olive oil and income uh, from these trees thousands of years after they were planted. It's the greatest manifestation of indigeneity, of love, of wisdom, and it's a testament to our connection to the land. And for that reason, they've always spoken to me, and I chose this photo to donate to the embassy as a, a sign of gratitude on behalf of the Palestinian people. Um, South Africa's uh, case against Israel at the ICJ um, has shown us that solidarity is more than a word, it's more than a promise, it can be an action. And growing up, South Africa has shown us that decolonization is not some abstract metaphor, it's not an abstract discourse meant to be kept away in elitist universities. Decolonization is a possible reality, and decolonization is a promise. 
When I say free Palestine, I look towards South Africa for hope. Thank you. Thank you, Azan. Thank you. Thank you, Azan. And uh, also, we're going to leave, I believe there's uh, olive oil that we've left uh, with you. And to, to all of us, please buy Palestinian olive oil. That is a form of resistance as well. Uh, don't allow them to um, uh, misappropriate Palestinian food uh, and take it from other companies that are uh, b benefiting the settler colonial project uh, in the West Bank and, and Gaza and Palestine. So uh, please, please buy uh, Palestinian oil when you can and other Palestinian products. And now, Mr. Ambassador, if you can come up, we'd like to present you with this award. On behalf of the Muslim Public Affairs Council, I'd like to present to uh, Ambassador Endemiso Ncheka uh, and the South African Embassy in Washington, D.C. In recognition and gratitude of South Africa's unwavering dedication to upholding international law and safeguarding Palestinian human rights. Thank you. No, thank you very much for thank you very much for first coming here to to our embassy. I guess I must welcome you to our embassy and say that we're so glad to see many of you here. And uh, and uh, also note that uh, you know when we talk about uh, activism in South Africa, in, uh, when we talk about activism in support of Palestinians, we, we always note that there are also a number of Jewish faces in those uh, protests uh, 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 in South Africa. So we used to think that probably South Africa is one of the few places in the, in the world where you still have uh, people who can relate to their past because those leaders, uh, Jewish leaders, are the leaders, who, most of them, who are descendants of the um, uh, Holocaust, of, of uh, the parents being uh, the, the victims of the Holocaust, and also people who fought against apartheid. And now people are saying, if the Holocaust was wrong, apartheid was wrong, so obviously, occupation ought to be wrong because we can't use different moral standards. It's the same moral standards. The, 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 the pain that was inflicted upon uh, the, 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 the Jewish people, the pain that was inflicted up, upon um, black people of South Africa, and the pain that is inflicted upon Palestinians is the same pain, is the same agony. So you cannot then separate and say this is what we call it. And to show that the, 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 the links are very strong, you know, uh, we could have been uh, freer earlier than now uh, in South Africa had it not been because of the Israeli state. Because the Israeli state kept apartheid state in South Africa alive for so many years and decades, they were armed to the teeth by what you call by, by, the, by the Israeli uh, uh, government, which in some, sometimes when we talk about this, we forget that uh, how far back this thing uh, uh, goes. And uh, we have been asked uh, that, uh, why are you so bothered um, about uh, what is happening uh, in Palestine? your issue that it's so many kilometers away, you know, you are not even a Muslim state. We have been asked those questions, which I found quite offensive, actually, because what it says to me, it says uh, we should be indifferent to the pain of, of uh, the, 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 the Palestinians. We cannot 
we suffered also. I was born under apartheid. I grew up under apartheid. The only world I knew, you let you, you grow up, out, up outside Palestine. The only world I knew was the apartheid world. Until I decided to take a deliberate decision to go and join the struggle against apartheid. Unlike my peers who enjoyed their freedom as young people, that's what I mean. You know young people, you go clubbing and all of those things. I never had that because my life was just a struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle. So I never had that uh, youth. My youth was taken by the struggle. Now I'm saying if that's the kind of um, upbringing I've had uh, um, and the environment that I, that, that I was brought up under, how possible can we then remain indifferent when other people are suffering the same way that we're suffering? In fact, in fact, apartheid has never killed 26,000 people in three months. Even at their worst, even at their worst, they've never reached that point. I think that's Israel has broken the record. They've reached that point. And I don't think um, uh, to, 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 to define them as a, an apartheid state is adequate. Maybe we need to find another way to, to say who they are because this is more than apartheid. This is more than anything that uh, the humans uh, know. Uh, this is something that I find it difficult when people say that, um, um, you know what, let's finish this business first and then we'll talk about the solutions, which is dialogue, which is dialogue, because at the end of it, we have to dialogue. But the issue is, do we have to die this much before we reach to dialogue? Do we have to sit idly and watch children and women being killed and all that? And then again, I said, I grew up under apartheid. And I can tell you that I've never seen anything close to this, of so many children and women being mowed down and all that. It used to be us, young men, who are killed by apartheid. But in this instance, it's, it's, a, it's a bit different. So I'm saying we think that we do have a moral obligation to do the little bit that we can because we also um, were supported by international community. I know a lot of Americans who said it was a long journey to move from that pavement to inside this embassy because they knew the pavement more than any other place. Uh, every day uh, protesting, getting arrested in front of this embassy but now they are inside the embassy. They come inside the embassy at any time when they wish. So I think if it was not because of international solidarity, I don't think we would be here where we are. I think we'd still be fighting that struggle if there was no international solidarity. International solidarity is critically important. International, we have watched, experienced, international solidarity changing attitudes of governments. Remember Margaret Thatcher, if some of you were old enough those days, there was a British prime minister called Margaret Thatcher. He referred to us as terrorists and he said Mandela is a terrorist and all of this. But the British public would not allow her to do that. At the end of the day, she had to eat the humble pie and speak to Mandela. So, so, so that is how powerful the, the, the public cared. And I think now we can even see it around the world that a number of governments are beginning to shift because of the pressure that comes from, from, uh, from, from people, from the real people, not from uh, the, um, uh, the, the elite and the politicians, but from the real people, the real people, the people who know what is suffering, the people who know what is pain, the people who know what is the difference between right and wrong. And this is something that 
I think we would really want to encourage you on that you should keep on doing this and not only end up with the Palestinians, but we also do it for each and every person in this world who's left out, who's oppressed, who's, who, who lives in an occupied territory, who doesn't have the rights that we take for granted, who doesn't have the rights uh, that uh, the right to eat. It's something that we don't know in some places. Right to eat, the right to, to, a, to a roof, to a shelter, something that are very scarce in, in, in other places. These are the things that I think that comes to mind as soon as I see people like, like you. And I, I get quite encouraged in that to know that, uh, uh, to see so many young people, so to know that which, when you see so many young people, there is future of this world, that they would be, this world is going to be moving towards, uh, uh, towards the correct thing to do, that we as human beings, what we should be doing and the, the correct things that we should do. I would be worried if it was my generation only here. But now that I see young people, I'm very, very confident. And uh, thank you for choosing to, um, for choosing to come to, to, to this embassy. I know you're all busy, but you dropped what, you, what you're doing to, to, to come and, uh, and see us. And we really, really appreciate your gifts. And uh, I've read about that, but I've never seen a picture of that. I think that picture, um, I don't know how many times have I told my mother the story of those, uh, of those, of the, of, of those uh, olive trees uh, that uh, the collective punishment, what it means of putting those trees and all that, that I think now if I show her this, she'll understand it even better, that that tree is more than a thousand years old and it has fed your family for all these years and all that. And thank you so much. Thank you so much to share part of you with us. I guess this is part of you and that you're sharing with us. We really appreciate that. Thank you very much. I just want to say, first of all, Ambassador, thank you for opening your heart as you open this home for all of us. We actually had to shut down the RSVP list. More people wanted to come, but we didn't want to overwhelm. So you see the tremendous response from all, uh, all the people. And then as uh, the smile of uh, Nelson Mandela is uh, overlooking us, I'm sure he's smiling today because all of the people, I, I'm sure he was a great teacher because to see people like you and to see people still in the South African government, South African society working um, and, and remembering and, and holding true to the principles, uh, that means that he, he did great work with your, with your great work. And finally, I also wanted to thank uh, your predecessor, Ibrahim, uh, Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul, who helped us arrange this event, and please extend our, our thanks to him. And again, well, uh, thank you so much for having us. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.